we stand on a just-in-time supply system. Uh, we stand on just-in-time staffing for a system of healthcare delivery that's happening right now. The heart attack, the stroke, the hip uh, replacement, the knee replacement is happening right now. That care uh, goes on irrespective of the disaster. And that care today, uh, and as we've seen certainly in the recent Time Magazine article, is a challenged, stressed environment that's fragmented, uh, and we're looking to improve that. What's interesting is preparedness stands on top of that challenged system. So we, in preparedness, have to actually take what the, the challenges that are faced today and build a system of preparedness on top of that. And uh, that really is, is a, difficult, uh, a, a difficult problem. So the big black box is, the, uh, is what we stand on. Uh, the higher level boxes are literally some hospitals, some healthcare coalitions, some healthcare systems working towards preparedness. Preparedness, at least for defined by the ASPR with regard to healthcare, is the ability to accomplish the capabilities that are outlined that I'm going to speak to. But the truth is, we are actually moving away from preparedness. There's no nurses, there's no beds available right now that they're just sit sitting around twiddling their thumbs. I was in the ER Monday. I had two ICU patients that I could not get upstairs. One was in the ER for 26 hours. So if we think we have surge, which the preparedness community continues to say we have surge, I'm not quite clear how we fix that problem. And perhaps preparedness needs to actually think about it differently, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. So to me, everything bubbles down to finances. Everything bubbles down to finances. If we stand on a $2.9 trillion industry that is competitive in nature, and the expectation is they will play well in the sandbox during a disaster, I think that's a goal, but perhaps a very difficult goal to achieve. With a $347 million program that ASPR has to encourage cooperation between providers, that is about 0.001 percent of their budget. Average hospital budget is about, what, 200 million, 150 to 200 million dollars. If you spread that from the AHA, spread that across the numbers of hospitals, that's about 30,000 per hospital. Not going to get us there. Have to think about it differently than what we do today. So what do we need? We need a system. We don't need a disaster medical system, NDMS. We need NDMS to be expanded, to be right-sized, and to incorporate appropriately healthcare delivery today, what's going on right now. So we need a disaster healthcare system that's integrated with all those pieces across the spectrum of care. We also need, today right now, we need a population-based approach to disaster health delivery. We don't have that. Today right now it's an individual-based healthcare system. So uh, the person who got admitted for the ankle fracture stays in that bed irrespective of the fact that there's someone sicker within the emergency department or someone sicker outside waiting to be brought into that hospital. So a shift in, during disasters to a population-based focus, and that's a challenge. And that's a challenge for nurses, that's a challenge for docs, that's a challenge for CEOs, because traditionally they don't think that way. A pillar that certainly we saw during Sandy, if we don't have the ability to maintain continuity of operations, then we can't get there. And this needs to be engaged in these, number one, coalitions. Let me stop here for one second and put a foot stomp. The name of the program is the Hospital Preparedness Program. The truth is it's the wrong name. I worked on the Hill in drafting that bill. It is actually the wrong name for, the, for where we are. Coalitions are the focus. Coalitions are long-term care, primary care, dialysis, EMS. EMS. Emergency management, public health. The critical three, emergency management, public health, health care. Health care has a broad umbrella under it. If you think that you are going to be a functional health care delivery system, a functional system, and you don't have your emergency manager within your county or state aware of and know of what your burn rate is for oxygen, what your burn rate is for your critical needs, and they know that if you go down or if things go offline to be able to support you appropriately so you can continue operations. If you don't have that plugged in beforehand, you're dead in the water. So the, tr the, the trio, the critical three, emergency management, public health, and health care, have to be the foundational elements of coalitions. The medical surge. This is evidence-informed. 
holy smokes. Preparedness, standing on, healthcare preparedness, standing on evidence. 2006, Lancet article, Gabe Kellen, reverse triage. 2009, secondarily validated in three different urban, suburban, and community settings. And most recently in 2012, Australia actually utilized the concept of reverse triage and did it right. So an evidence-informed approach to the new medical surge. This is operationally tenable. Why I'm going to stand on this? Because we could talk about this all day long on the ivory tower and say we have great research, but if the CEO and the COO can't get it done, then the best research won't change the day. This is an economically sustainable approach. Why? Because the hospital preparedness funds won't get us there. You can't grant our way to medical surge in the preparedness community. I think we should move away from the concept of, or the, the language of medical surge. Build it within the system. This is an economically sustainable way because it'll be done every day, not just on game day. So here's the benchmark <clears throat> that at least the hospital preparedness program is focused as a provisional benchmark. Ready? No new surge, pardon me. No new staff, no new space, and no new stuff create for me the ability to handle 20% higher acuity patients. I heard recently somebody said, oh, during an evacuation, this means we have to offload 20% of our patients. No, not the case. 20% of higher acuity patients for an event. Would this happen for a bombing? Yes. Is this based upon some of the good work that was done uh, out of CDC for in a moment's notice and thinking about how fast we have to respond to an event like Madrid? Yes, it is. So within a short period of time, you have to have the ability to respond to 20% of your coalition surge within the system. Would it work for a pandemic? Yes, because the same concepts that we build in the ability to monitor acuity across your system of care, you use throughout a longer term event. So this IBA engages the whole healthcare, builds on daily delivery of care, promotes all of us together to respond to an event, and minimizes, minimizes the need to shift to crisis standards of care. So those who are graphically oriented as I am, this is the way we used to do things. We take additional surge and we mount it on top of a system that's already stressed that I can't put an ICU patient in a floor bed right now. This is the new way it's gotta get done. So this is some strategic linkages I'm going to just speak to. I spoke to the, the concept of National Disaster Medical System. These are the heroes that we call to respond to events that go in and buttress systems of care. But those systems of care, we actually don't have right yet with regard to disaster health delivery. So NDMS has to be plugged into a disaster health care system that we are trying to get there. And looking to at least HPP and our CDC partners to try and encourage the healthcare delivery system, a private system, to think about population health. And that is not consistent with their modus operandi today. And that's a challenge. Second, there are strategic linkages with the Affordable Care Act. What does the Affordable Care Act encourage? It encourages providers to come together to affect care better for your diabetic management for your hypertension. So under ACOs, those providers come together, work together to affect, hopefully, better outcomes. Isn't that exactly what we're talking about with healthcare coalitions? Bringing providers together, irrespective of how you're defining providers, EMS, emergency management, come together to functionally work as a unit to affect care and disasters, to decrease mortality and morbidity. So lastly, crisis standards of care. We all know during a disaster, you eventually will get to the point when you can no longer function or no longer have the resources or no longer have the manpower to be able to respond to an event. And that's a shift to crisis standards of care and it's a challenge for all of us. But the truth is if we get coalitions right, we have to shift to crisis, shift, if, if we get coalitions right and the ability to execute IBA, then we have to shift the crisis standards of care less. So it creates greater depth on the bench. 
innovation in and around medical surge, you don't hear about it a lot. And I think that this is one of those, those key pivotal times that we might have a couple different uh, pieces that, that are innovative in and around medical surge. So thanks. It, it's really, it's wonderful to be here to, to continue this discussion uh, this morning about surge and the response to surge and broadening uh, our capabilities and our strategies. Uh, so <clears throat> Marco, right before I came up, said, hey, are you going to talk about telemedicine? Uh, which actually in the healthcare, in the healthcare facility perspective with regards to immediate patient, uh, immediate bed availability, I call it immediate patient care availability. It's not any sexier. Uh, <laughs> telemedicine actually is a very, a very real and durable strategy that has and can and will be used in the future to help meet some of those gaps. But that's for another session at another meeting. So today what I'm going to talk about is picking up on some of the themes that I discussed during the plenary session this morning and that, that Dave brought up around crisis standards of care and looking at crisis standards of care and specifically that catastrophic disaster response framework as a way to look at, number one, where the challenges lie and hopefully where the solutions uh, potentially exist. And really highlight for you the fact that as we continue to talk as a healthcare com community writ large, we have to talk about the full spectrum of care delivery, uh, not just healthcare facilities but I really want you to think about the crisis standards of care framework as really the roadmap for how we can bring all of these disparate pieces together. And just touching on this very quickly, for those of you who haven't seen this in the report, you know, we, have, we spent a lot of time in the 2009 and then again last year in 2012 focusing on the importance of the ethical considerations and the rule of law and the legal framework uh, upon which all of this is founded. That's where this conversation begins. And then noting the important steps uh, that bring us towards crisis standards of care planning with a recognition that education and information sharing are bounding this conversation, and then the pillars of hospitals and, and public health, out of hospital care, EMS, emergency management, are really those pillars of the emergency response system that have to be brought together, all of which are bounded by local and state government and ultimately the federal government. We have a whole world of providers who we all have you know, interactions with and intersections with and somewhere they come up through the various systems that we're responsible for. And I really dare say that we have not really fully tapped into that resource. And that's a huge resource that is just waiting for us. But the other place I wanted to draw your attention is that center pillar. And it's a center pillar because as, as you've heard me say now a number of times, it really is the heart and soul of healthcare delivery in the United States. And that is everything that is encompassed under the out-of-hospital care uh, spectrum. So, so let me um, focus a little bit of attention on that. In our 2012 report, you know, we noted that the value of the outpatient sector is its diversity, and it's also the challenge because of that diversity. It's not one size fits all. And in every given community, there are different um, elements that you really want to draw upon both in terms of the leadership that exists within the, the outpatient sector, as well as some of the capabilities that, that, that they have to bring. From my perspective, the challenge that we face right now is this, the, this overlap that exists between the community, sort of the community resources that are out there and the public health world that has access and inroads to those communities, but don't necessarily control or own them. And so what we have is a chasm into which this, for the most part, this entire energy of moving forward on a community-based planning capability has uh, wallowed for, for, the, for the last decade. So, you know, borrowing from the military, if we think about echelons of care, um, looking at the, at the y-axis, there really is home care. There's what I call Main Street triage. There's all of that care that can be delivered in the outpatient setting. There are um, alternate care facilities, which is a more formalized manner of, of organizing that outpatient care, which we've talked a little bit about. And then there's, you know, healthcare facilities or hospital-based care and so on. And along uh, the, the x-axis are really the echelons of contact, if you will, the way that we essentially affect where people go. This is a lot about messaging. 
you have peer-to-peer -peer networks. That's you and I just talking about, hey, what do you think's going on? I don't know what's going on. Do you think we need to seek care? Well, I don't know. I haven't heard anything else. There are phone banks, and so what you're going to hear in Lisa's section is really a description of this sort of echelons of contact where we're really trying to broaden the approach to delivery of care. You, have, uh, you can have community, local AM radio, a whole host of other communication tools, and then you can do that at the national level. And why is this important? This is important because these really affect the delivery of care. If we don't have a good model for describing how care should be delivered across the continuum in an event, people are going to skew to the left. And what that means is that it's going to drive healthcare to the very traditional um, <coughs> locations uh, that we're used to seeing care delivered. People are going to go to the hospitals. They're going to flood the emergency departments. They're going to be less reliant on how we deliver, deliver home care and so on. If, on the other hand, we have a much more effective and, um, and, and a much uh, better distributed way of sharing information, we're going to lessen the, the curve uh, or the slope of that line. And again, this is pretty crude. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this, a little bit more complicated, if you look at the number of patients who present over time, and you assume that the middle line is kind of the, the average demand for healthcare services. If you, again, if you have ineffective messaging and you have very poor interventions, patients are going to skew to where they know they're going to mostly receive care. On the other hand, demand with effective messaging, I think, is going to be uh, ameliorated. So this, if you haven't been convinced yet, I hope that these begin to share uh, or at least um, uh, confirm for you sort of the, the rationale why this is a worthwhile investment. When we look at the delivery of care across the out-of-hospital spectrum, we have to recognize that that can take a variety of forms. De Beaumont Foundation and RAND, uh, Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C., and Inova Fairfax Children's uh, just uh, completed and published a study looking at the use of a web-based triage tool for pediatric patients who, um, who may, whose parents may have questions in terms of whether they really need to come to the emergency department or not. Uh, and we, um, we found that this was a safe and effective way of being able to deliver important actionable information uh, that was done safely. So you have electronic care. You have ambulatory care. We heard a lot today with regards to this uh, Sandy discussion about shelter and shelter medical care, non-ambulatory care services, emergency care services, and then sort of surgical intensive care, kind of along this spectrum of delivery. As we talk about, you know, um, about the spectrum of care and moving from a conventional to contingency to crisis response, never always trying to put in place tools and mechanisms and strategies that don't even get us to crisis. Uh, we are really beginning to shift that focus from patient-based outcomes to population-based outcomes. And our inclusion of the full surge, uh, spectrum of surge capabilities should be put in place to avoid, to put those, just those very strategies that would prevent us from ever having to move across that contingency to crisis um, threshold. We want to increase overall health system capacity. Uh, I think that we want to, of course, continue to ensure strategies that exist to meet hospital surge capacity needs. That's the immediate patient care or immediate bed availability piece. But we really need to improve outpatient and home care uh, surge capacity. We want to emphasize reduction in non-emergent care. So strategies like our web you know, triage tool um, are one of a number of ways of doing that. We want to establish screening and early treatment centers because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, and that really will ameliorate what that surge looks like if we get people early. We want to get patients to the right place at the right time, and we want to manage and balance resources and resource requests to ensure that there's consistency across the delivery of care. Uh, because if, in fact, you know, in one community, and this goes right back to our first IOM uh, report and the, and the guidance uh, therein, if in one community you're doing it one way and in another community you're doing it the other way, People aren't going to, you know, they're not going to buy that. So, so I think that th we have an opportunity. I would, I would say that um, in the context of, you know, the hospital preparedness program, in the context of both the FEP uh, and the HPP grant guidance, we really have the chance now to move forward. 
these are not easy solutions to, to, uh, to impart, and they really do take a whole of government and a whole of community approach. But I think that in the last couple of years, we've been put on the right path, and we're moving in the right direction. And now our challenge, collectively, is to, to really allow it to continue to move forward. Thanks. I'm going to take you down sort of a narrow path and give you an example of something that we're currently exploring, and that's our nurse triage line project. This is, I want to say, a very close collaboration with both ASTO and NACHO, as well as a whole host of other partners. Uh, too numerous to, to name right now, but uh, it is a quite a, a collaborative effort. During a catastrophe, and I'm going to focus on an influenza pandemic that's severe, we could see the need for people to have a place to go to not only get care, but also to get information. The more severe the event is, the more urgent people are going to feel about connecting with reliable, credible information, the more worried they're going to be, and the more they want to clamor and go to healthcare facilities to assure that they're okay or if they're ill to get rapid treatment. But in doing so, we could see our EDs, clinics, medical offices surge to capacity. And that, indeed, would present a delay in seeing a provider. And an antiviral medicine, which is the treatment for her influenza, is a prescription-only medicine. And we assume it would stay that way during a pandemic. And therefore, if you couldn't see a provider very quickly, you could have significant delays in treatment. One of the key features about treating antivir with antivirals is that they must be given within preferably 48 hours after symptoms arise. So the window of opportunity for effective treatment is very small. And if our system is surged, people may be blocked out of getting care. So we you know, had the opportunity in 2009 H1N1 to look back to think about what had happened there. We were very fortunate that in most places around the country, the outbreak was mild to moderate and did not create uh, this kind of scenario for a prolonged period of time. But what if we went forward to a severe pandemic? And I'm gonna take the concept that Dr. Hanfling spoke about of the spectrum of care and ask you to think with me about that as I talk about this project. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to match the person's needs with a best place for them to get care. If they're worried, they don't need to go to the ER. But if they're sick, they need rapid treatment. So uh, we were inspired for, by this effort um, that Minnesota had done. Erin DeVries and Ruth Lenfield from Minnesota really put together a very unique program during 2009 H1N1. You know, during the spring wave in Minnesota, they were quite hit hard, and some of their medical care facilities were surged, particularly their pediatric facilities. And now they're in the summer of 2009, they're looking forward to the fall wave. Nobody knew what that fall wave was going to look like. And there was a lot of concern that that fall wave could be tremendous and that people could be severely ill, and that the numbers of people affected could be large. So they worked together in their community and in the state to c bring together the eight large health plans that had a nurse triage line, and created another nurse triage line, telephonic care, so that people could have a place to call, a nurse to talk to, and a help with deciding if they needed to seek face-to-face -face care, or if they could safely stay home. In addition, they wrote a protocol that all the medical directors of these health plans signed off on that allowed those nurses working under protocol to provide access to antiviral medicines so that people that met certain criteria could get access to this prescription medicine and not have to go into a health care facility. They fielded over 27,000 calls from October through March when this system was active. And they did an evaluation after the program was over of about 5% of the callers. They were very, very satisfied with the services they received. But very impressively, Minnesota calculates that they feel they as, um, averted about 11,000 unnecessary clinic and ED visits. And that was the first time that I had ever seen anything really demonstrably show promise for mitigating surge. So inspired by what Minnesota did and what many of you uh, uh, did also in terms of your telephonic efforts during 2009 H1N1, 
we launched this nurse triage line project, again, in collaboration with many partners. And the goals of the project were, first of all, to improve access to antiviral medicines to ill persons during the <coughs> pandemic but also to enhance the provision of timely and accurate care and information rather, to explore alternatives to face-to-face -face contact where it's appropriate. And also we have another component to this project. I'm not gonna be explaining much about it today, but we are also testing with Voxiva, a mobile testing, texting technology that provides support and follow up to patients who are prescribed antiviral medicines. We think that's a, a very valuable part of this telephonic care process. <clears throat> you know, anytime that you're trying to create something new, it's really good if you don't have to start from scratch. And so one of our first questions are, what already exists that we can build upon? And if you look at the slide in the blue boxes, there are nurse triage lines that operate every single day in this country, either affiliated with hospitals, medical care practices, clinics, and other entities. Those, those uh, capabilities aren't in a necessarily uh, working together in a coordinated fu function because they are all sponsored by different organizations, but they serve a lot of the public's needs. In addition, some public health departments also have in their emergency plans the idea of standing up a nurse triage line during a severe pandemic. So we postulated, could we create a coordinated network of these nurse triage lines? Could we create new nurse triage lines just like Minnesota did for those who did not have an access to an existing nurse triage line who were uninsured or unaffiliated? And it was important in our thinking to not just have the care provision piece of this, we also need the information piece. A fully a third of the callers to the Minnesota system, all they wanted was information. They weren't ill, they weren't caring for someone who was ill, they were just worried and they needed information. So we started talking about 211 lines as perhaps a front end to this system. First of all, why poison control centers? Why do we bring them in? as a possibility. Well, they have unique capabilities for telephonic care. They operate in every state 24-7 of free services to the public. And they have experience in providing emergency information and guidance, especially during 2009 H1N1. They're staffed by nurses and pharmacists and poison specialists, and they're trained to provide telephonic triage and treatment recommendations. They are also quite good at keeping people safely at home. Approximately 70% of their patients, they can manage at home. So it seemed to be an ideal opportunity to work with a piece of the healthcare system that frankly I think is underutilized. 211 is a network of telephone information services. Usually they're providing social services. You know, how do I sign up for food stamps? Where do I go get help with, with the food in my community? Uh, where do I seek care if I'm uninsured? And every community uh, has some resources, telephonic resources, but 211 in particular is all over the country. They have an amazing network in the cloud so that they can shift surge around from local location to location seamlessly to serve the public. The operators who function in 211 are experienced in determining what people need and referring them to local resources. So the initial concept for this nurse triage line is if a pandemic occurred, and particularly one that caused a high severity, widespread illness and death, CDC would be issuing treatment guidance, um, both for physicians and nurses and other entities, and would send that guidance not only to our usual channels, but to all of the existing nurse triage lines that exist in the country today, to be able to bolster their ability to serve their patients. But if things got worse and hospitals started surging and uh, it was difficult to get an appointment, to get an access to an antiviral medicine, we might turn on a new system where nurse triage lines would be um, augmented by poison control centers. And we're testing that idea now to see the feasibility and acceptability of doing that. And feasibility and acceptability have been an important part of this project ever since the beginning. We've been looking at legal issues, capability issues, developing uh, guidance and protocols, resources that are needed. 
Acceptability is important. It must be acceptable and it must fold in to local and state plans and not disrupt anything that you folks are working on. So we've got three projects that we've been doing. One is a simulation that we did in El Paso, Texas uh, last week. And then we have two community conversations, one in Seattle, Washington, where the Poison Center there serves the state, and one in Portland, Maine, where the Poison Center there actually serves three states, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So we're going to go to communities, health care coalitions, hospitals, public health, emergency management, nurse triage lines will all be there as well as poison centers and 211 representatives to talk about this effort and to see how <coughs> an effort like this could sync with local plans and whether it would be useful and helpful. So what do we think the benefit might be of a coordinated network of nurse triage lines? I would say that there are many benefits. Um, we feel like that they will improve access to prescriptions for antiviral medicines, that they can direct ill persons to care if needed. And what's really important in Minnesota was that not only were they telling people, you know, you can stay home and here's how you care for yourself, but 2% of the callers actually needed to go to call 911 now. And 15% of the callers in Minnesota were advised to go to emergency room now. So it's the whole spectrum of care, not just keeping people away from healthcare facilities, but assuring those who need to go to facilities actually get there. It's about providing timely and accurate information. You know with the 24-hour news cycle, some of what you hear is right and some of what you hear is not right. And so nurses and other trained professionals providing information can improve that. It also can reduce transmission of infection in waiting rooms. When we talk about pandemic, one of our key strategies is social distancing, keeping sick people and well people apart. If you're just worried and you're sitting in an ER for six hours while people are coughing and spewing on you, that's not social distancing. And we might see an enhancement of transmission of infection in those settings.